Hi everyone, I hope you're all well. So the George Floyd protests have well and truly given way now to riots, looting and in the case of Seattle, armed far left insurgents who have literally taken over a district in the city and have turned it into a co-op no-go zone. In addition to this brand of radical activism, shall we say, a number of big corporations have jumped on the bandwagon. It's the usual brand of woke capitalism. Oh look, we're a big corporation but we're standing with the little guy against whatever the latest in vogue social justice gripe is. Some examples of this are Yorkshire Tea, who advised a right-wing YouTuber not to buy their tea again after she praised the company for not joining in the corporate virtue signaling, saying they were taking some time to educate themselves and plan proper action before they post. Then there is Amazon, which is prominently displaying Black Lives Matter material on its platforms, and Adidas, who has self-flagellated for its alleged lack of diversity and has introduced new affirmative action policies to ensure at least 30% of all new positions in the US at Adidas and Reebok are filled by Black and Latino people. How wonderfully patronizing. Now, normally we can just laugh at the lengths companies will go to in order to appear woke and trendy and thus avoid an activist pylon. However, there are a few big corporations engaging in woke capitalism in a different, more sinister way. And by different and more sinister, I mean it has shades of what various dictators like Mao Stalin and a certain early 20th century German nationalist leader whose name I cannot mention because YouTube will get me into trouble. I'm talking, of course, about Netflix, BBC iview, Stan, HBO Max and others who are against the better judgement of what I'm guessing is the majority of the population, removing classic TV shows and movies from their services because they depict so-called outdated cultural stereotypes. This is all in the name of Black Lives Matter and anti-racism and wokeness, of course, as if banning TV shows and movies for being a product of their times or set in a particular context is going to do anything other than annoy the punters and generate resentment, thus potentially making racial tensions worse. Notable shows on the chopping block are Little Britain, The Mighty Boosh, League of Gentlemen, an episode of Faulty Towers, Gone with the Wind, which has been removed temporarily by HBO Max and will be reinstated with a discussion and a denunciation of its allegedly racist content. And the one that really grinds my gears, four of Australian comedian and writer Chris Lilly's satirical faux documentary shows, Summer Heights High, Jonah from Tonga, Angry Boys, and We Can Be Heroes. Four shows from one comedian. I mean, that's got to be a massive slap in the face for Chris Lilly. So what is the grand cardinal racist sin these shows have committed? Do they promote harm or violence against black people? Do they insist they're not equal to white people and should be discriminated against? Well, no, of course not. The cardinal sin here is, in the case of Little Britain, The Mighty Boosh, League of Gentlemen, and Chris Lilly shows, white actors painting their faces darker in order to portray characters of a different race, the name of which you all know, but again, I can't actually say that on YouTube because they will get me into trouble. In the case of Gone with the Wind, it's set during the American Civil War and is considered to contain racist depictions of black people and glorify the Confederates and the Old South. So, in other words, these big streaming companies have done nothing meaningful to address racism. All they have done is insulate themselves from the noisy minority of outrage mongers who are on the rampage at the moment because they have too much time on their hands at the expense of normal, sensible people who do not like being told what they can and can't watch or what they should and shouldn't find offensive. It's also, dare I say it, incredibly patronizing of black people and smacks of a white savior complex, as if black people, one, all think and feel the same, and two, are so fragile and sensitive that they need to be protected from material they may or may not possibly be made to feel uncomfortable by. That sounds pretty racist to me. But are these shows as objectively offensive and racist as Netflix et al. have apparently decided they are? I mean, sure, the act of white people blacking up their faces was a way of ridiculing and subjugating black Americans, and it peaked in popularity during and after the American Civil War when racial tensions were exceedingly high, which is why there is such cultural sensitivity about it still today. I am not about to stand here and defend that. Gosh no, it's rude and racist and demeaning and should be roundly condemned. 
Of course, context and intent play an enormous role in all of this. So are the racist minstrel shows of old the same as, say, Chris Lilly playing Tongan schoolboy Jonah Takalua in Summer Heights High? I always say I'm disruptive. He said I wanted to next to Troy. He's a next to Troy. But they don't even know that I'm just trying to make things more fun and more interactive. Kids in the class don't even care because they're doing their work and they're concentrating and it's boring and all of a sudden they get a joke and they just get a little break from their work and they get to laugh. So that's not, if that's being disruptive then fuck you. That's not disruptive, that's entertainment. Or Matt Lucas and David Williams using brown makeup to convey and critique stereotypes of British people. And in the case of Gone with the Wind, which features black actors playing black roles, does the fact there are slaves and slave owners depicted as they were written in the book it's based on grounds to say it's racist enough to take down pending a disclaimer about how apparently racist it is? And more to the point, is all this taking down of classic TV shows actually achieving anything towards ending racism? Well, the answer to all of that, of course, is no. And as somebody who is very aware of a lot of the material that has been taken down, namely Little Britain, Gone with the Wind, and Chris Lilly's comedy, I can tell you this about the people who are supporting this censorship. Either their critical thinking skills have gone completely out the window, or they haven't actually watched any of the material. Because if they had any critical thinking skills, or had actually watched the material, they would know that, in context, nothing about these shows is so offensive or racist that it's worth taking down from streaming services as some sort of big, grand, anti-racist sentiment. Let's start with Gone with the Wind. The movie, based on Margaret Mitchell's classic novel, which I am currently in the middle of reading, very coincidentally, depicts the story of Scarlett O'Hara, a southern belle and daughter of a rich plantation owner whose world is brought crashing down by the American Civil War. Now, while it does tell the story of the war from the perspective of the Confederates, and while it presents the world of the Old South in somewhat of a normalized light, it doesn't actually glorify it. In fact, the movie, and also the book especially, is quietly critical of that whole world, portraying it as vapid and indulgent, devoid of purpose, and ultimately, worth leaving behind. Not only that, the heroine of the plot, Scarlett, is a literal sociopath, and while she is beautifully portrayed by the incomparable Vivian Lee, she is about the most unlikable, devious, Machiavellian female protagonist you will find in the American literary canon. If anything, the story is an indictment of the Old South and points out the pointlessness of their so-called glorious cause, rather than a racist, nostalgic depiction of it. Also remember, black actress Hattie McDaniel was the first ever African American to win an Oscar for her performance as Mammy in the film. That would have been massive in 1939 when it came out. As for Chris Lilly's brilliant depiction of Tongan schoolboy Jonah, well, I'm going to defer to... <laughs> myself here on this one. In the case of Jonah, again, if these people would actually consume the material, they would realize that what he gives with Jonah is an extremely thoughtful, meaningful, heartfelt uh, portrayal of a lot of the issues mm. that Islander disadvantaged kids face at disadvantaged schools. I mean, you look at Jonah, his mother died when he was very young. He has a father who probably smacks him a bit too much. He's falling behind at school. He's isolated in his, in his friendship group. Group, you know, he has a lot of a lot of problems. He experiences racism at school, but then you see he thrives so wonderfully through breakdancing and through art. And there are so many disadvantaged kids, Islander or otherwise, who have that story. And it's, it's a wonderful sort of critical, very sympathetic view. There's nothing mocking about it, but you're telling me you just add a little bit of brown makeup to Chris Lilly and suddenly wow. that wonderful storytelling and writing is offensive and deserved to be banned? I mean, how does that make any sense? sense. Side note, there are two YouTube channels here that you should definitely subscribe to. The first is the Sky News Australia channel, which is where the early clip came from and where most of my other TV segments are uploaded to, and the second is 
my YouTube channel. Now, I know some of you out there will have watched two, three, maybe even four or five of my videos and you haven't yet hit that subscribe button. So now is the perfect chance to do just that. I do two videos a week and two live streams a week. So if you like my content, then hit that subscribe button right now. I would love to have you. The removal of the four Chris Lilly shows that specifically depict racial performances while leaving other shows up is very revealing. See, Netflix at all might be doing this culling to portray themselves as doing their bit to make their platforms just that little bit more socially aware and less offensive. But Jonah from Tonga isn't the half of just how garishly wonderful Chris Lilly's comedy is. Enter Jume Private Schoolgirl. Jimmy Private Schoolgirl tells the story of Jimmy King, the Queen Bee of Anglican School Hilford Grammar, played by, of course, Chris Lilly, and all her wild adventures as a private school girl. And as someone who not only went to a private girl's school, but knows people who went to the private school that the show is based on, and the fact that my school is actually mentioned by name in one of the scenes. Well, if he was really your boyfriend, then why was he hooking up with other girls? He, he, totally, was. he, was. he totally hooked up with Tash Moransky oh, from one scene the other way. You could say I have a rather personal attachment to the show. Anyway, Jamae Private School Girl is infinitely more offensive than anything in Summer Heights High, Jonah from Tonga, Angry Boys, or We Can Be Heroes. There is nothing sentimental or heartwarming about this character. She is a lovable villainess throughout, and she embodies all of the worst stereotypical characteristics of white, rich teenage girls. I mean, it is just brilliant. But any regressive leftist activist looking through it could easily make a case for racism, sexism, transphobia, offensive stereotypes. I mean, you name it, there is a joke in there that could be said to embody it. Like, for instance, when Jemay's rich South African white father discusses his experiences growing up in Johannesburg. And personally, I got to know a lot of blacks while growing up as a kid in South Africa. Very decent people. Great workers. Or the way Jamey refers to students of Asian descent. Well, at school I'm pretty much friends with everyone. Like, everyone thinks I'm really nice. I'm getting in a photo of the Asians. Oh, oh my god. And I think as school captain, that's a really good thing for me to be the ambassador of, like, niceness. Hello. Hello. Oh my god. I'm gonna gram it, I'm gonna hashtag fried rice. <laughs> Or the fact that she sponsors an African teenage boy from a disadvantaged neighborhood and uses him to gain social clout and status. I would now like to introduce to you my latest project, Kwame. This is Kwame. He's from Uganda. It's in Africa and he's really adorbs. I've been spending time with him in his community in this really poverty area in the western suburbs and I've been like reading to him and just chilling and stuff. It's legit a seriously tragic environment. Go away and stop trying to f***ing cash in on my African. Oh my god. Mommy, what did you think of that fat girl that came up? Did you like her? Say no. No. See? Yeah. Kwame yeah. <laughs> only speaks the truth. <laughs> Needless to say, it is my absolute favourite of all of Chris Lilly's shows. I mean, it is just so funny. I highly recommend you watch it. I mean, that one at least is still on Netflix. But the fact Jemay Private School Girl is still up and running, regardless of the fact it is objectively far more jaw-dropping than Chris Lilly's other shows, proves that these streaming services are not really interested in being woke or creating a safe space for viewers. They just go with what is trendy as a way to advertise themselves and also to insulate themselves from any kind of potential outrage mobs who may be sent their way. It is all pointless. All in all, whether it's looting, defacing statues, missing TV shows, or mass protests in the middle of a public health emergency, the world has officially gone mad. As they say, 2020 is wild, y'all. Let's just hope we all come out of it more or less with our collective wits. If you liked that video, please remember to like, subscribe, share, leave me a comment, and if you really, really liked it, then check out the video description for my subscribe star link and other ways you can support me. Thank mm -hmm. you.